day. I hope you're well. I am Ethel Drida. The story you're about to hear is my story, told by my friends and my followers, and sometimes by me. My story is the same as it is for everyone. Our lives are a journey to find out what's important to us. We all tread our own path on this journey, and there are many distractions along the way. Occasionally, we stop and look back to rest and to consider. It's not always easy to see God's plan for our lives. And I hope you'll understand why I did what I did. Anyway, my friends will tell you about me, which is not always easy for me to listen to, although they will say lovely things. We will start in the church that I founded in Ely, just a wooden building with a stone floor. It's not yet finished, nor will it be finished in my lifetime. My friends will carry on my work, so please be kind to them. Oh, you startled me. You've brought me the ink. Thank you. You're new here, aren't you? Time is a strange thing. Sometimes it flies by as if there's no stopping it, and you struggle to remember what happened. Sometimes it moves so slowly you feel like it will always be the same, and it seems there is nothing to remember. Perhaps scholars in the future will look back at our age, study our writings, and gain an understanding of us. That is why we must write what happened down, so there's a record for them, so they know. I am Sister Sawena. Welcome to our Abbey. I was born a daughter of a nobleman who gifted me to the church so I may dedicate my life to the glory of God. But my good fortune was the privilege to be a companion of our Holy Mother Ethelreda. Now that she has passed, it is important that I note down all that I recall of her life so it's remembered as it was. Oh yes, it's not just monks who can read and write. We nuns can do too. But this will be taken into an account written by a monk, so it won't bear my name. But it will bear the name of our Holy Mother, Ethelreda. That bell means it's time for prayers. I could tell you the story of our Holy Mother, Ethelreda, if you like. You'll know of her. There are two of us here who were with her the longest, Sister Sawara and myself. We know what happened. Well, most of it. You should talk to her. She might remember different things. Sister Sawena, you must come now. Sawena! That is Sister Sawara. We must go. There is to be a new abbess, Holy Mother Ethel Breeder's sister. We must be there for her. We will say a prayer for Holy Mother Ethelreda, and then I will tell you her story. You must understand this all happened within living memory. Our island was a place of hardship and sorrow. England was divided into kingdoms, each ruled by a royal family looking for ways to increase their power and wealth. Sometimes these families waged war against each other, Sometimes they fought amongst themselves. They showed their strength by invading their neighbours. A wise king sought to make alliances where he could. The best way to make an alliance was by marriage. Royal and noble girls knew that this was their duty. Their parents would find them a match to try and unite different kingdoms. Often it worked, but never for long. Violence was always just over the hill, watching for any sign of weakness, waiting to strike down on the people with fire and sword. So the people put their trust in these so-called spirits of water, earth, trees and stones. They made sacrifices in the hope that these made-up gods would show them favour. But they did not. Famine War and disease struck the people and these so-called gods did nothing. 
every tribe had their own beliefs. Most of their time was taken up with the struggle to survive by growing enough food to feed their families. Any extra they grew was taken by their lords in return for their protection, which often came too little, too late. When the light of Christ came to England with St. Augustine and his ministries, it started a revolution. Suddenly there was hope. The monks did not invade with drawn swords. They were warriors of a different sort, armed with faith and ready to lead by example. They helped the poor, comforted the sick and elderly, and ministered to the needs of all. This happened only 30 years before I was born. There are still some who hold on to the old ways, but more and more people now follow the example of Jesus Christ. I hope that I and the women who I have lived, worked and prayed with have been some small part of this movement to establish our church in this land. you. You're new here, aren't you? Welcome to our little community. Sister Suena said you might come and talk to me. She said you were interested in learning about our Holy Mother, Ethelreda. So you're the daughter of a king? You look like one. You're no peasant. I can tell by the look of your hands. Don't worry. We're all noble-born here. I am often asked by noble women anxious for their daughters what a life dedicated to Christ is. I think they wonder why it would appeal to a noble woman who instead could be a loyal wife, a mother of princes, a good hostess, leading a life of luxury, comfort and security. Of course, I can explain how my life through chastity, obedience and prayer is for the glory of God and show how through my dedication it might lead others to embrace Jesus Christ hmm. but I see how they look at me for their view is what I have given up not what I have gained what I have now is the strength and faith to face this world on my own terms I learned that from our Holy Mother Ephrogida I think of her every day. I miss her smile, her strength and determination. I think people imagine that if you're religious, you must be very serious. Holy Mother Ethelgeda was the opposite of that. Everything she said and did came straight from her heart. Even when faced with difficult choices, she was still full of joy. I wish I'd known her as a child then I would understand where her strength came from. I was born in East Anglia. My father, Anna, was the king of East Anglia's cousin and given the job of protecting our borders with our powerful neighbors, the Kingdom of Mercia. At this time, many kingdoms like Mercia were still pagan. As I grew up, the Christian church was becoming more and more established. My parents and our king, King Sigbert, were Christian. I do not remember when I decided to dedicate my life to Jesus Christ and become a nun. But it's like I always knew in my heart that it's what God wanted me to do. My family was a happy one, and these were carefree times. I remember when I was young, King Sigbert decided to give up the burden of being king to become a monk. My father was given more responsibility and he and my older brother were off and away. You could sense the storm clouds were gathering. The Mercians, who lived north of us, were ruled by a powerful warrior king called Penda. He was a pagan. His army fell on us, raiding deep into East Anglia and the people were powerless to stop him. Our villages were burnt down, our goods and animals taken, and our people enslaved. King Sigbert came out of retirement from the monastery to lead our army. But it was no use. 
there was a battle. King Sigbert and many of his warriors were killed. My father became King Anna, and my sisters and I became royal princesses. My father knew that King Penda and his army would come back, and so he looked for an alliance against the Mercians. King Erkenbert of Kent was a devout man. He was actually the first king of Kent to order the destruction of all pagan shrines and idols. My sister Siaxba and King Erkenbert were to be married, and my dear sister left our family for a new one. I missed her company terribly, and I spent more and more time in the church thinking and praying. But there was an important consideration, my duty to my family. My father knew that King Penda and his army would come back, and an alliance with the Kingdom of Kent protected the south, but Penda was in the north. My father knew that King Penda couldn't be stopped, but if he knew when he was coming, at least he would be ready. There were tribes who lived on the northern borders, who lived in fens and marshes, and they were in the perfect position to act as a lookout. But how could my father create an alliance with them? Well, he could create an alliance through marriage. My marriage. I suppose you could say I was a bit confused about which path to take. To be a nun or to be a wife? When I was still young, we had a visitor, an aunt. Her name was Hild. Hild spent nearly a year with us, and I spent much of my time in that year talking with her. She was very kind to put up with me like that. Like us in East Anglia, her lands in Northumbria had been ravaged by Penda's armies. Like me, she had a hard choice to make. She was the daughter of one of the most powerful kings in England, should she marry another powerful king to provide security and stability for her people? Should she follow the many other noble women who have crossed the seas to France to take up the life of a nun, leaving her homeland behind forever? Or should she return to the north and establish her own religious house where she could be a nun? Hild came from a wealthy family, but she'd already chosen to reject all worldly wealth by choosing a life without luxuries. Her mind was free to explore the things she was really interested in. After a year, she chose to return to her native Northumbria and live as a nun. Her wisdom, advice and her example served me well in making my choice. She went back to serve her people by building a monastery. I would serve mine. I dedicated my life to Jesus Christ. But my father... King Anna, he had other plans for me. We weren't one of the big kingdoms. We lived on the Isle of Eels, Ely. Our chief, Lord Tombert, he ruled over all the islands, but we were small fry. The marshes protected us, really. We watched as King Pender of Mercia's army marched against East Anglia. We followed their path from the smoke from the villages they had set on fire. We prayed for them. What else could we do? After the Mercians had gone, we had a message from the new king of East Anglia, King Anna, asking us if we wanted to form an alliance and offering his daughter, Princess Etheldreda, to be our Lord Tombert's wife. Well, to be honest with you, this was a great honour. Lord Tombert asked me if I would look after her when she arrived and act as her steward, run her household and provide her with anything she needed. I was glad to. We were told that she was beautiful, that Princess Etheldreda was very religious, and we were told that although she would be Lord Tombert's wife, she would not share his bed, but that we were to keep that quiet. I suppose, I imagine that she would be very, very serious. Anyway, Lord Tombert brought Princess Etheldreda back to her new home. We looked at her, she looked at us, and then she smiled. 
the thing that struck me most about her was her laughter. I, I, at first I was worried. I, I, I thought she might be laughing at us. Coming from a royal palace, uh, she would find us simple and backward. But no, 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 she found joy in everything. She had a way about her that made everybody happy just being in her company. She was charming, playful, but serious too. Very, very firm in her religion, but also very humble with it. She didn't judge anybody. She accepted you as you were. She didn't try and change you. You just wanted to be more like her to make her happy, to hear her, her laugh. Uh, Princess Ethelreda did spend a lot of time in prayer uh, and she encouraged other people to join her. For a royal, she ate less than a sparrow. Two or one meal a day. Very, very simple food. There was nothing extravagant about her at all. She did everything she could to support our Lord Tombert. Uh, the people loved her for that. We discovered that she wanted to be a nun, but she never blamed anyone or complained. Lord Tombert regarded her as a, a sister. He accepted the condition of their marriage that he would not share her bed. She was really interested in us, in her people. She, she wanted to know how we lived and what we did, so she journeyed from island to island to, to meet with us, and to speak with us. Lord Talbot loved her for that. She, she loved him. He gave her the island of Ely as a wedding gift. Anyway, two years passed, and then we got word that King Pender of Mercia's army was on the move again. We sent messages to King Anna, but it didn't do any good. I was given the job of telling Princess Ethelreda the news. There'd been a battle, and her father and her brother had been killed. And if that wasn't enough for her to deal with, we, within the space of a year, Lord Tombos fell ill and he died. So in the space of a 12 months, Princess Ethelreda became a, an orphan and a widow. When my husband died, I thought I had done my duty for my family. Perhaps now I might be able to retire from the world and find peace in a religious house in France. I had no other ambition. My mother and two sisters were nuns. My father and brothers were dead. What else was there for me to do? I devoted myself to the people of the Isle of Ely. Luckily, I had Ovin to look after my estates. I appointed him my governor. The chaos of war rumbled on for another year. King Pender went to war with King Oswy of Northumbria, another powerful kingdom in the north. The pagan Pender against the Christian Oswy. We heard about events up there. They sounded terrible. When King Pender and his puppet king of East Anglia were killed in battle, one of my uncles became the new king of East Anglia. So surely now I would be allowed to follow my heart and become a nun in France. I'm trying to remember my first sight of Holy Mother Ethelreda. It was at Creighton Dune, near Ely, she was building her own church, a simple wooden building with a roof of thatch reeds. She spent most of her time in prayer there. I had travelled up from Kent. Her sister, Queen Seaxbra, had suggested that I would find inspiration in East Anglia, and I did. When I arrived, Holy Mother Ethelgreda was passing amongst the workmen with a basket full of loaves. There was a fire with some fish cooking. Loaves and fishes, I thought. How apt. She knew everyone by name. She stopped to talk to them, to listen to what they had to say, to offer them encouragement, and then she moved on. Ethelreda welcomed me and made me feel comfortable. 
before asking about her sister. She took great delight to hear my news that her sister was well, and her nieces and nephews. There were a few of us noble women there, looking to serve God and the people. She gave us focus and purpose. We worked and prayed and lived as if we were in a monastery. Ethel Reader didn't try and take charge or issue instruction. She purely led by example. Any time anyone gave us food or candles or firewood, then she would make sure it was shared amongst us equally, with no favour shown. She tried to keep things as simple as possible, so that we had the time to dedicate to that which was important to us. If anyone neglected the rules or made mistakes, she was quick to forgive, blaming herself for not explaining her intentions clearly enough. Time passed as if in a dream. I've said before, we had no sense of one day ending and another day beginning. We were given money from the new king, but otherwise were left to our own ends. Until we received an unexpected visitor. I was on the Isle of Ely looking after Princess Ethelreda's estates, keeping him informed of how the people were and any other news that happened to pass through our land. After all the attacks and invasions and battles, it seemed like the great kingdoms were seeking alliances through marriage rather than raising armies. It felt like things might be getting back to normal again. Anyway, a messenger arrived from Princess Ethelreda's sister, Queen Siaxpa of Kent, saying that she wanted to come for a visit. Well, with most of the land now Christian and the kingdoms at peace with each other, getting from Canterbury to Ely was fairly straightforward. The tricky bit was getting across the marshes at the end. Princess Ethelreda was really excited at the prospect of seeing her sister. Then another messenger arrived from the new King of East Anglia, the Princess Ethelreda's cousin, saying that he wanted her to marry again. A prince from Northumbria. We were all amazed. Marriage? Well, I broke the news to Princess Ethelreda. She took it very well, but I could see that inside she was troubled. Anyway, a few days later, her sister arrived. I was overjoyed to see my sister. She was a queen and a mother of princes. All the things an English noble woman was supposed to be. But she was also deeply religious, just like the rest of our family. She had chosen to serve her people, marry and have children. She used her husband's wealth to found religious houses so the people had places to pray. The news of my forthcoming marriage had shocked me. But my sister talked to me not about what I might lose, but how I might serve God. Northumbria was a cradle of Christianity, and I would be closer to Hild and all the good work she was doing. The Kingdom of Northumbria was also the most powerful in England. If I said no, they might well take offence and invade East Anglia. Finally, the Kingdom of Northumbria possessed great wealth. I might be a princess now, but in time, I would be a queen. I could use my influence to see that the wealth was passed into the construction of churches, monasteries, perhaps even a school for noble women who wished to serve God. I said if I could have a similar arrangement with Prince Egfrid, my husband-to-be, to the one I had with my dear Tonbert, I might be persuaded. My dear sister, Siaxpa, was a constant support to me. We talked and prayed, and eventually I agreed to make the journey, some 300 miles north, to the royal palace of Bamborough, to wed Prince Egfrid. When Ethelreda announced that she wanted to make the long and dangerous journey into the kingdom of Northumbria, 
we were all amazed. We thought our life here at Creighton Dune would always be the same. Of course, we all wanted to go with her. Ovin, her steward, begged to go and this she allowed. I was very lucky to be chosen among some of the others. There were some noble women from East Anglia, as well as some of us who had shared Ethel Dreda's life here at Creighton Dune. We set off, and it was as if we were journeying to the end of the world. Wherever we went, Ethel Dreda drew a crowd to look upon her and pray with her. As always, she seemed unaffected by the turmoil and the hardship. As we made our way north, the roads got worse. Everything took more time. But Ethel Dreda was there, leading by example. Eventually, after what seemed an eternity, we arrived at the city of York and I gave thanks because I thought we must be nearly there. And then I was told we were only about halfway. And so on we went. Ovin the steward acted as a go-between with the local people who flocked to see the woman who would be their new queen one day. As ever, Ethel Dreda won them over effortlessly. Eventually, we reached the northeast coast and we looked up at the great wooden walls of the royal palace at Bamburgh. We had arrived. We'd heard so much about her. She was beautiful and full of joy. Prince Egfrid was clearly in love with his new bride and King Oswy was happy to see his son well matched. Ethel Dreda was presented with many fine gifts and as with all such events, when it was over and the marriage feasting had ended, we all settled back down to normal. It was suggested that I should be a companion to Ethel Dreda to tell her about her new Northumbrian home. So over the next few months, I was in her company constantly. She was such an easygoing person. She never had a bad word for anyone. She dressed very simply, avoiding anything showy or luxurious. She wore very rough materials that must have rubbed her skin. She ate one simple meal a day and bathed in cold water. If it was a feast day and we had hot water to bathe in, she let the household use it first and bathed last. Prince Egfrid would visit her often. He was always so attentive, bringing her gifts of fine cloths, furs, jewels, which she'd gratefully receive and thank him for. And when he was gone, she gave them away. I think he thought by showing her generosity that he could win her to his bed. But he could not, and that was that. Sometimes you could feel the friction between them. Princess Ethelgida, though, was always careful to behave correctly to show the respect a wife must show her husband and a queen a king. I grew closer and closer to her. She'd been given some land near Hexham by Prince Egfrid as a wedding gift. She wanted to build a monastery there. So I suggested the best person she speak to was a monk, newly arrived at a Northumbrian court, Brother Wilfred. This was the start of a very important friendship for Ethelgreda. For in time, Wilfred became a bishop and spiritual advisor to both Egfrid and Ethelgreda. You never know what direction your life will take what God has planned for you. I was to stay in Northumbria for 10 years or thereabouts. At first, it was a little awkward. My new husband could not understand why I would not lie with him. But eventually we came to an understanding. We had more pressing matters to occupy us. His father, the great King Oswy, was often ill and Egfrid was away more and more on royal business. I was in constant contact with Hild. She had done exactly as she said she would and founded an abbey in Whitby, 
a house for monks and nuns where she was the abbess. I wondered if I may be able to withdraw from the world and become a nun there. But without my husband's consent, it was impossible. My husband complained that I would not give him an heir, that people would think that he was weak if he could not even rule his wife. I argued the opposite was true. By showing that he supported my desire to be pure, he was showing the strength of his faith. I do not know that I convinced him, but Bishop Wilfred was on my side and he tried to persuade him. But then, in the year of grace, 670, the great King Oswy died. Now my husband was King Egfred and I was Queen Ethelreda. I was thrust into the world of royal politics, away from the simple life that I craved, of thought and prayer. I longed more and more to escape. I pleaded with my husband to let me go, but his pride would not allow it. For two long years, Queen Ethelreda tried to persuade her husband, King Egfrid, to put her aside so she could become a nun. And for two long years, he refused. But then he changed his mind. Perhaps it was the influence of Bishop Wilfred, or Cuthbert of Lindisfarne. Or maybe it was Ethelreda herself who finally persuaded him that it was for the best. Anyway, it was decided that Ethelreda and a party of her servants would go to Caldingham in Scotland so she could become a nun. So we entered the nunnery there. But then we heard that King Egfrid had changed his mind. We were so afraid that he would send men to come and kidnap Ethelreda and take her back by force. We were all terrified, so she hit upon a plan. We'd escape to the safety of the Isle of Ely. It was decided that only three of us would travel with her, so we had more chance of going unnoticed. So when her, and myself, Sawara. Ovin was asked, of course, but he'd come to a great decision that he wanted to serve Jesus Christ more directly by becoming a monk. So he left us for the monastery at Lastingham. Another man came with us and we packed only what was essential. We slipped away and made our way south, praying every step of the way that God would protect us and we would not be caught. I wrestled with my conscience for a long time about leaving Queen Ethelreda's service. But I knew in my heart it was the right thing to do. It was God's will. I had some time before I went, so I offered some advice. A party of three noble nuns and a male servant on the road would be an unusual sight. We didn't know what King Egfrid might do when he found out that Queen Ethelreda had gone, so I suggested that they stayed off the obvious route, the main roads, and instead they took the bad roads, paths and trackways, which would be less direct and slower. I told them to say that they were pilgrims. Some people might be interested in them, but most people probably not. But if they were asked any awkward questions, I knew that Queen Ethelreda would be able to charm them. We just didn't know what King Egfrid might do. Perhaps he might do nothing. Or they might round the corner of the road to find a party of armed horsemen waiting for them. I should have had more faith. Of course God protected his own. They set off, and progress was slow, but they were never confronted by a, a band of spear-carrying warriors sent to arrest them and take them back. Slowly, they made their way south, as I began my journey, here, to the monastery, to become a servant of Jesus Christ. I prayed for Queen Ethelreda every day. I remember the heat of that journey, the road crumbling under our weary feet, the raising a cloud as we made our way along. 
We were exhausted, but Holy Mother Etheldreda kept us going. One time we stopped to take a rest under some trees and by a stream, and we drank there. I swear, the water was the sweetest I've ever tasted. We sat in the shade by our walking staffs, and before we knew it, we'd fallen asleep. When I woke, I used my staff to help me get up. When I looked at Holy Mother Etheldreda, she was stood by hers, which, by a miracle and in only a few hours, had taken root and grown branches and leaves. It was truly an act of God. I am told that a great tree still stands there and that the local people have built a church in honour of Etheldreda. We continued on our way and as before, time ceased to have any meaning for us. We wandered in the wilderness, trusting that God would guide us and keep us safe. After an eternity of journeying towards our promised land, we arrived in the sanctuary of the Isle of Ely. We rejoiced. We were home at last. It was as if time had stood still whilst I'd been away. There were many new faces, and old ones too, with more wrinkles, myself included. But the Isle of Ely was exactly as I had left it. I knew that my husband had tried to pursue me unsuccessfully, but what he would do next, I did not know. I prayed for an answer, and it seems like my prayers were answered. As a nun, it's as if I was no longer of this world. In legal terms, it was as if I was dead. So King Egfrid was free to take on another queen, which he did, Eomenberger, who had been his companion before, which meant I was now free to establish a church here in the Isle of Ely. This was going to be a larger project than my previous church in Creighton Dune. I wish for a place like Hild's Monastery in Whitby, a double house where men and women could come to be educated and live a life of prayer and devotion. It was going to be hard work, but we were ready for it. After all I'd been through, it felt like a great weight had been lifted from me and I was finally able to do what I wanted to do all along. So, we were to establish our religious house here, away from the towns and the cities in a quiet corner of the world. My sister, Siaxpa, had established a monastery on the Isle of Sheppey in Kent. Well, if she could do it, I could do it too. I was to be consecrated as its first abbess. Where is it? Oh, oh it's you. How are you settling in? Of course, once the religious house was established by Ethelbreda, young noblemen and women came to visit. Many of them stayed to take up a religious life. Sister Siwara and myself stayed by her side through her last illness. She got a lump on her throat. She said it was the fault of her pride. She was too fond of necklaces when she was young. Death didn't seem to worry her. She embraced that like she embraced all challenges, with an open heart. Holy Mother Ethelreda died surrounded by those who loved her and, on her own instructions, was buried in her church in a simple wooden box. Her sister, Siaxborough, came up from Kent to take over as our new abbess. You see what I mean about how time seems to quicken up and slow down? Princess, Queen, Holy Mother. I wonder how she'll be remembered. Perhaps she'll be made a saint. Sister Suena, come on or you'll be late. Come on, we will say our prayers. Nothing in life is sure. We will do our best and trust in God. We are still missionaries. <laughs>